Let's see. Here we are. Hello. <laughs> so nice to see you. I'm familiarizing with the StreamYard uh, equipment here. But this evening, I am going to answer all the questions I didn't have time to answer during the Live Liberty workshop that we had last Wednesday. And I was a bit sorry about that because I really wanted you to get your questions answered. But after one hour and 45 minutes, I felt like, you know, the time was running up. So what I've done, I've taken the chat from the workshop and written out all the questions. Yes, and there were very many good ones. So if you are here this evening and you didn't get your question answer, answered, or maybe you have other questions, then uh, please uh, let me know in the comments below. Okay, we start with this one. Uh, she says, my horse tends to rush, get jiggity on the trails. And what uh, do you have a solution on how to solve it? And I think it could be a good solution here actually to try to figure out why. Because it might be your horse is rushing and getting jiggity on the way homewards and not when away from the stable. And if your horse is only doing this when away towards the stable, you probably have a stable magnet and your horse is, you know, eager to get homewards and that's why your horse is rushing. So by changing your training a bit to do like more work by the stable and less work away from the stable, you are going to, uh, to change it because you're going to change the horse's uh, home, home boundness. And I made a blog um, a few months back about how to solve this because this is also a huge thing that we need to work on when riding at Liberty. So our aim is to have our horses forward away from the stable and looking forward to go out on trails and also not rushing homewards. So I do that by basically riding off and see where I end up and where I end up is where I train, which is then usually outside of the stable. <laughs> so I'm not steering them or making them go away from the stable. I make my ID of going away from the stable, the horse's ID uh, until the horse you know, it's just as straight and forward away from the stable as towards the stable. So that could be why your horse is rushing. Uh, another thing uh, is how to solve it, which is if a horse is rushing and jigging and all that stuff, we tend to, you know, do half holds and stop them with two reins. And this is not going to solve the problem. So it's much better to do bend to stops and bend to slower speeds if a horse is rushing. Because when doing the bend to stop or bend to slower speed, you put softness in the horse's body and the horse will cross over behind and use the hind legs and slow down. But by doing uh, half halts and two rein stops and whatnot, the horse can still be stiff and hold on to the tension. So two rein stuff and half halts is not going to empty worry because the horse is probably a bit worried since it is rushing uh, in the same way as a bend to stop or a bend to slower speed will do. So use uh, one rein at the time until both reins are great and the horse has gotten a habit of not rushing and not jigging on the trail. Okay, I hope this helps. Yes. And the next questions, there are many questions. I'm not sure I'm going to make it through all this evening either. <laughs> Let me know in the comments if you have a horse who's rushing and jigging and if this uh, helped out. Yes. And the second question is about uh, bucking and bolting. And I take this as a little bit in the same category here because it's the same solution. Uh, because if your horse is yeah, rushing or bolting or bucking or rearing, for that matter, the horse needs to stand in both hind feet to do it. But if we do the bend to stop or bend to forward, 
the horse crosses over behind. And when they're crossing over behind, they can't buck, they can't bolt, and they can't rear. And they're also not rushing anymore because making them cross over behind and softening their body will empty out worry and prevent them from bucking and bolting and rearing. So a much better way to solve bucking and bolting and rearing is to ask the horse to do something they can't do without bucking, bolting and rearing, which is to soften their body and cross over behind. If this helps, yes. And it has at least solved uh, the bucking and bolting problems uh, I have had with the horses I have gotten or trained for others. And again, this will solve it much better than using two reins because the horse can go against two reins and buck even better when <laughs> getting some support from the reins. And, and it's not uh, going to prevent the horse from um, from doing these things because the horse still have two hind feet uh, on the ground. Yes, to support. And I think um, some other things you might want to look into if you have a problem with these things is like saddle fit and your horse's um, anticipation of the saddle and the tack and stuff like that. Uh, you might also want to look into the horse's teeth. Like if something is bothering them, they might also do stuff like this. And uh, something, one thing that's very, very important, like uh, she says here that she has a mare, she's four, no, four years old and uh, rears when spooked or when frustrated. And this very, very often happens when we are using two reins. So very often the best solution for solving rearing is to drop the reins and just ride forwards because the horse is rearing because the rider is preventing them to go somewhere they want to go by holding on the reins or making the horse want to go somewhere the horse doesn't want to go. So immediately when the horse, when the rider drops the reins, the horse doesn't have this resistance anymore. So uh, like I talked a lot about in during the workshop, like <clears throat> mounting your horse, dropping the reins and riding off and doing your exercises where your horse ends up and where your horse wants to be is going to solve the rearing. And it's also going to solve the reason for rearing because after a while, your horse will not have these aversions to going somewhere or attractions to going somewhere else and just wants to be where he or she is. And this is also something we can do when riding on trails. Like I explained in the beginning, yes, by making work by the stable and more favorable to go out on trails. So I hope, uh, hope this helps. And uh, one of the biggest problems with rearing is, of course, that the horses tend to get a huge release for rearing. Because at least if a horse rears when I'm riding, I lean forwards and drop the reins, right? So we tend to then release on, on the wrong thing. Versus if we just mount, drop the reins and ride forwards, the horse is not going to rear and we get rid of the reason for rearing. Yes. And uh, some of uh, the attendees were looking for hind leg engagement. And again, the bend to stop, or in this case, bend to forward, is a great way of getting hind leg engagement. And also when leading with outside turns, we can kind of engage the hind and make it a habit. Then, and especially when you're leg aid is reaching the hind legs of the horse makes it very very easy to get hind leg engagement and in ride like viking members i show a very good exercise for how to attach your leg aid to the hind legs of the horse which is very very easy but many riders uh, forget about and many horses have kind of more of a front foot reaction to the leg aid than a hind foot reaction to the leg aid. And also quite a few horses, they tend to become a little bit stiff when we pick up on the reins. 
but by working on the riding signals separately, like the left rein and the right rein and the left high leg aid and the right hind leg aid, then we get the our aids working perfectly, which is going to make riding so, so much easier than if we have semi-good riding aids and we try to do something with these riding aids that doesn't work so well. Okay, I hope this helps. And uh, there was also uh, one in the comments there on the workshop who says, my ex-trotter is herdbound and has separation anxiety, is rushy and also insecure. And I also am uh, retraining a Norwegian trotter. And what I found was that, you know, starting with the connection exercise, and the riding signals was very, very beneficial because we could then build like a habit of calmness. And, and she would then be usually very calm when doing this. We were just doing it kind of slowly and comfortably for her. But I also found that this wasn't really enough to help her self-regulate. Because if something happened out on trails or something unexpected happened, she would kind of get up and she didn't have any way of finding relaxation again. So now I'm doing uh, the hooking on with her, which seems to make her a little bit upset. She doesn't really like it, but that's a good way for me to be able to get her a bit up and teach her ways so that she can find relaxation herself again. So not necessarily keeping her calm, but teaching her to find calmness after being up. And we can't teach, us, teach horses to find calmness after being up without them ever being up. And uh, if you are riding an X racing horse or a trotter or something like that, if they first get up, they can be up for, for quite a while. <laughs> so... I, uh, I assume that that could sometimes be the missing piece in the puzzle to succeed with these horses. But I definitely I recommend starting from a place of connection and relaxation and build on that. And if that's not enough, then the horse might need some training in being able to regulate and find calmness after being up, which also is what, you know, characterizes a well-trained horse. You can go like, full gallop and then you can go down to a halt and ride off on loose reins without without the horse being worried but with these trotters and x race horses that can be a challenge because they go into this racing mode right and uh, they need just to to help practice it yes so don't go in the pitfall of keeping the horse calm at all times they also need to uh, to regulate but horses, they always seek relaxation and calmness over being anxious and worried. So we have the nature helping us out here as well. But it, of course, can uh, can take some time. But that's, uh, that's my best tip, at least, in addition to the exercises. Is there anyone else here in uh, watching this live now who has an ex-racing horse or trotter who has uh, experienced the same? Like we've been done the, doing all the all the stuff. We have done the connection. We have done the riding signals. The horse is soft and relaxed, and you know most of the time it goes well. But if the horse gets up, it can be a bit difficult to get them back down. So let me know in the comments if that's you. Then maybe you need to work on you know the horse being able to find relaxation also from self, not always when we are helping them. And we can't do that by always keeping them calm. Yes, which might seem a bit counterintuitive. <laughs> but horses, of course, they learn stuff much, much better when they are calm and relaxed. So I wouldn't teach them new things when they aren't calm. Because then it's not going to work. If you teach a horse to back up who is frustrated, you will get a lot of frustration in that backup, right? And the horse is becoming stiff and not soft. And the same with moving the hind end over. If the horse is frustrated and scared, they are not going to, you know, move the hind end over with softness. But there's one thing we can't teach them by always keeping them calm, and that's to 
find relaxation again after being up. Yeah. So I hope this makes sense. And let me know if you were on the workshop and <laughs> that you, you find it valuable that I take the time to reply to all the questions. I really hope so, because uh, I was a bit sad that I couldn't uh, reply to everyone. Yes, uh, there's another question here. If the horse runs away while lunging, what to do? And I... Uh, I would recommend, you know, stopping the horse by moving the hind end over because then the horse isn't going to run away from you. But I also recommend teaching your horse to stop by you stepping backwards and the horse finding its own stop. So a very, very easy way to stop horses when lunging, either at liberty or on the rope, is to step in front of their drive line. So they will stop but they might kind of hold tension in the stop. And sometimes they don't stop, they just turn the other way around and start running in the other direction, right? So I don't step in front of their drive line when stopping them. I either move the hind end over and then after, afterwards they find their own stop from softness in their body and using their hind legs, or I step backwards. Yes, and um, when stepping backwards, not all horses will come towards me and find their stop. But I continue moving backwards for a while and kind of give the horse a chance to figure this out. And if they don't stop, I go back behind the driveline and ask for forward again. So in this way, we're not forcing them to stop, but we are teaching them to find their own stop. Which again, like with these racehorses and trotters, will teach the horse to self-regulate because we're not making them do anything, but they kind of figure this out for themselves. And they also start to listen very much to our body language and pay their attention towards the center of the arena where we are. Yeah, so I hope this helps. But we have uh, several video series in the Ride Like a Viking members showing you exactly how to succeed with this. But this is some of the things that really transforms these more difficult horses because it gives us the ability to make our ID their ID. Yeah. And they, they have to kind of figure it out from self. And when they learn something from their own experience and from choice, it becomes so much deeper learning than when we simply make them do something. Yeah, I hope this helps. And someone is asking, does verbal cues fit with this program at all? I'm like, yes, verbal cues uh, fit very well with this program. And um, you just have to be aware of where you put your verbal cues. So if you want your main cue to be verbal cues, then that's the cues you need to do first. Because it's the first cue we give the horse that is the cue, right? So if we, uh, if we want our horse to go off of a verbal cue, like clocking, then you need to clock first and then give leg aid. But if you give leg aid first and then clock, then clocking doesn't mean forward. And of all the verbal cues, I am least... Um, like, I dislike the most, <laughs> yeah. I dislike the most clocking because if you, if you look at a horse and you clock, you will see very many horses, they will kind of stiffen their neck a bit and drop their back a bit. It's like a, it's a bit like upsetting sound. <laughs> So uh, I'm not a very fan, uh, fan of clocking. I think a better way to ride forwards is to use our leg aid, which is then attached to the hind legs of the horse, because then the horse is going to move off with the hind legs. At least it's more likely the horse is going to use the hind legs than if we are simply clocking, then it's more likely the horse is going to lose the back a bit, become a bit stiff in the neck and then go forwards. So I don't necessarily think that sound cues are more kind than body language or riding signals. 
yeah but if you're going to use them use them first and then have the other signals at as follow-up signals later like I, I really like the whole like the woha to stop but if you're going to teach your horse to stop off the woha you see woha first and then you ask to stop later with your seat and your reins because if you stop with your seat and your reins first and say woha afterwards the horse isn't going to stop off the woha it's going to stop off your seat and your reins but it's very fun to play around with this, especially at Liberty. It would be very nice to have at least five different ways to stop and that these five different ways to stop can work um, like without being attached to each other. And of these uh, signals, then, of course, the difficult one to disattach is, of course, our seat signal, because we tend to do it like automatically without even thinking we do something with our seat before stopping. So it could be a fun uh, way to check if your woo really works is to lean forwards and sit in the forward position without your seat being in the saddle and then say woo and see if the horse responds. And if the horse doesn't respond, then the horse probably doesn't know the woo as well as your seat. Yes, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I made a video the other day of how to teach your horse to stop off a neck rope. So we use the neck rope first, and if the neck rope doesn't work, we follow up with our rein. But I probably used my seat before I even used the neck rope, because by thinking stop, you know, we do stuff with our seat and our body. Yes, let me know in the comments if uh, your horse knows how to stop off a wuha or off your seat, because that's wonderful. And then we are not as depending on the reins anymore, right? Because we have different ways to stop the horse. Yes. And there was also a question here is, um, is it possible to work on this with school horses somehow? And uh, she then rides um, at a riding school and wonders if it's possible to do this uh, ride like wiking program when being in the riding school and i honestly i'm not sure because i think the methods and the philosophy of uh, of the ride like wiking uh, training will probably conflict quite a bit with how the the riding teacher is instructing at the riding school so usually at the regular riding school, we don't give the horses a whole lot of choices, right? And we don't take the time to make our ID the horse's ID. It's very mild, much like mount the horse, pick up the reins and make the horse go where you want to go. While the Ride Like a Viking program is like mount the horse, drop the reins and see where you end up. <laughs> and that's where you work on your riding signals and make sure they are very good. So uh, I think the program probably works better if you have kind of leasing a horse for three to four days a week or something than if you are attempting to do this with a horse who is in a regular riding school problem program <laughs> in a regular riding school program yes and it doesn't have to be a problem because there are riding school who are, schools who are offering this way of training horses now you can find uh, like Christy Pemberton's um, trot about riding school in Washington state. She has restructured her whole, whole riding school to and uses this program and this way of training horses. And she says that the horses are so much happier and the students as well. So the students who attend her riding school, they have to kind of earn the ride and learn how to make their ID the horse's ID. Because you also say here that um, the horse that you have as part of your education is very stiff and showing you the cold shoulder and has a whole lot of symptoms of not being happy. So that's what Christy also experienced with her riding school, that now the horses are much softer and much happier. So it is possible to run a riding school without... Um, you know, wearing out the horses. 
Yeah, Eva's read the center in Norway. She also does a whole lot of fun stuff with uh, at her writing school, uh, which isn't necessarily like the same routine over and over again, and always, you know, riders using too much riding signals basically and wearing out the riding aids. And in Switzerland, we also have, of course, Pia's uh, riding school which is wonderful and they do kind of these gallops with ponies <laughs> and liberty shows and all kinds of stuff. So uh, you can also find, if you find the right riding school, this is not going to be a problem. Yeah, I hope this helps. Yeah, there's uh, quite a few questions about the connection exercise actually. Uh, there's a two-year-old filly cub who pushes into me to teach how to teach her to move away from pressure. So I would say you don't have to teach her to move away from pressure. You just do the connection exercise and get relaxation on a distance outside your space. Because if we have a horse who is pushy and always in our space and we try to push the horse away, what often happens is that the horse learns that they are stronger than us, which they actually are, and then push against our pushing. So do the connection exercise and get relaxation at a distance away from you and make that a resting place. Then you solve the problem with the horse without getting into a fight. Yes. Yeah, I think, and there were quite a few questions about how to get forward. And uh, just as a general, I'm going to say that I talked so much about how to get rid of magnets and anti-magnets, if that makes any sense. Like how to make our ID the horse's ID. Like if the horse wants to go to the gate, instead of preventing them to go to the gate, we do our work with our riding signals there by the gate so that the horse doesn't associate the gate with the riding being over or being reunited with the herd. And we also get rid of the horse's ID of wanting to go there. So we get rid of a whole lot of um, unevenness and stiffness in the horse, like the shoulders popping up and all that stuff. Because when the horse wants to be where they are and not everywhere else, they tend to be straight, right? But if you have a horse who isn't forward, I would not begin with getting rid of magnets because you would want to use the magnets to get forward. So um, you can then ask for forward towards where the horse wants to go. <laughs> so that's definitely a huge uh, part of succeeding with horses who lack motivation is to use the horse's inner motivation to ask for stuff that is likely to go well. So if, if you have a horse who isn't very motivated from going away from the stable, who has, you have done a stable magnet, you can lead the horse away from the stable and then you can trot homewards because then you have at least trotted and you can kind of build motivation from there. But if you get rid of the magnets, you don't really have anything that motivates the horse and draws the horse. So, but we have a whole video series in the membership on how to motivate a not so forward horse, where I show you how to get forward and motivate forward. And also uh, what I do to, you know, get him forward. Yeah. <laughs> Without uh, needing so much pressure. And uh, I also try to vary at the training. I see there's another one. She has a three, three year old horse who is lacks forward in the groundwork. Like I don't do the, the same groundwork over and over and a whole lot. So once the hooking on is good and the Liberty basics are great, I move on to something else. So I think that can also be a little of a pitfall here with these horses who lack motivation is that we need to have variation. So I do the groundwork until it's good enough and then I move on. But if I would continue doing groundwork, which I think you might want to do since it's only a three-year-old, I would add new stuff into the groundwork and variate it. Put on small obstacles there, 
if you don't have any magnets, you can make a magnet by like giving your horse rewards at a certain place so that your horse wants to run there. So anything you can get the horse to do like from self that is fun, playing football is awesome. And also pony, like bring your horse along as a hand horse. That's something they love. They get to, you know, move freely beside another horse and, uh, and you can train. They learn a lot from being beside you when you ride another horse. Yeah, if you are into the sound cues, your young horse is going to learn the woo-how before <laughs> you ever ride him. So stuff like that. Yeah. Try variation. Yes. So this is definitely not about doing the same over and over again and, uh, and making the horses kind of bored with it. And, uh, and to make it like a routine so that the horse knows the drill. Try to surprise them a bit. Yes. And if you have a stable magnet, be happy about that stable magnet and use it for what it's worth. Like Olaf and Glanne were galloping home towards the stable or cantering home <laughs> towards the stable. But that was the best way to get him to canter. But like most riders, especially if you're riding with kids, you know, I don't recommend you canter home towards the stable. But if you have a horse who lacks motivation, who's been in a riding school for several years, then maybe that's what you need to do for a while to, you know, get back the joy of running. Yes, I hope this helps. I can't really see any comments right now, but thank you so much for, for joining this evening. And there's another thing about this workshop, which I'm also a bit sorry about. So the first thing is that I couldn't reply to all the questions which I've tried to do now. The second thing was that there were too many attendees for my Zoom upgrade. So I've upgraded my Zoom account to 500 attendees. And some of you were not able to join the workshop because there were more people than 500 trying to sign in. But we are holding a new workshop on Wednesday, <clears throat> the same as the week before. So if you weren't able to join, <clears throat> last Wednesday, you have the chance this Wednesday. And you can secure your spot on ridelikeawiking.no slash liberty. And we do it all over again. Yes, so I look very much forward to, to see you there on Wednesday if you couldn't join last time. So I hope this helps. And thank you so much for watching this evening. And if you didn't join the workshop, then you still have the chance to join live on Wednesday. And there you will also see videos and certain exercises you can do to get started with your horse. Okay, bye for now. See you next time.